this, as long as you have consent, there is nothing better than this. This is how life is supposed to be. Do you know what happens if you if you grow up in a village and you speak Shona? Um, you think the whole world speaks from <laughs> you, especially if they look like you. I mean, if, if they are white, then you can understand where they are from. But, but if you are an African and you speak Shona, and every African you know, everyone you know in your village speaks Shona, and then you meet someone who says, I can't speak Shona, then you say, You can't be a human being. <laughs> I'm serious. There's no way you can be a human being. Because all human beings speak your children. That's how we reason. Now, see, that's why we have the Bible. So that we so that even those comfortable aspects in our cultures can be critiqued and challenged. Not by another culture, but by the Bible, by the word of God. So we're not using culture to, to, to critique your culture and say, no, we should all be like. Uh, Africans must be Western, we should all be like Europeans or whatever. No, 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 that's not the point. The concept of marriage in the Bible. So what we are doing here really is back to the, to the Bible. Because we suffer the wrongs, we suffer because at times, in most cases, we have moved away from God's design uh, and God's idea for, for marriage. All right, so we can agree on these following points that the foundation for marriage in the Bible is found in the story of creation. That's why as Adams, the doctrine of creation is very important. It speaks to the whole idea of self. It speaks to the idea of, of marriage. If we say we were not created as evolution, it also distorts our understanding of marriage. The more we believe in the creation, then we know that marriage was also divinely instituted. Foundation of marriage in the Bible is found in the story of creation, in particular uh, in the story of Adam and Eve. So marriage exists because God designed it and instituted it in the Garden of Eden. So Adam and Eve did not invent or discover marriage. You know, it is God who brings Adam and Eve together. <laughs> It was not Adam who went to God and says, I found the woman as I was walking in the garden of Eden. The myriads. So that God now is also surprised. But oh, there was a woman here, you know. Yeah, I found, I found it. Can we do something? It was God who saw Adam and said, it is not good for men to be alone. And God, not Adam, there was no request. There was no service request. There was no request from Adam that can you organize something for me? I'm struggling, I'm struggling, I'm alone. It was God. Adam did not even know that uh, there, there could be something like a woman. It was God's idea. And now people find each other, they run away from God. I mean, the very same Adam, you know the story. When 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 Eve ate of the tree, uh, from the tree, that uh, forbidden tree, Adam looked at him and says, No way, there's no way I'm going to. But it's God to organize this woman for you. You think that was the last woman God would have organized for you? And so the whole concept of marriage in the Bible is God's idea, including sex. Did I say that? He did not invent sex. Sex was invented by God. I know when we, whenever we use the word sex, I say, ooh, pastor, turn off the lights. <laughs> you can't talk about sex either. I mean, nothing is for, you know, it's private. And maybe, maybe, I'm not saying it's, it's not, but it was invented by whom? It's God's idea. Don't take sex and run with sex and leave God behind. It, it comes from God. If you think it's wonderful, then imagine how wonderful God is. <laughs> I'm appreciating the saints here. <laughs> All right. Marriage is directly described as the foundation of spiritual community for human beings and determined by God and the people. So you know it's a very basic, very block. Now because the society goes, as the family goes, so goes the society. 
is the family also goes to church. And those of us who want to see a revived church, you will never have it until there's revived families. And now people who talk about evangelism and say there's no time for families. We want to bring we want, now we want our, our church to be revived. And 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 and, and, and Jada took us through uh, the importance of family in our in our evangelism. Our churches are, are comprised of families. If there's no true religion, then it's why it says that in the song. In the family, you won't find it in the church. So let's deal with those families. Actually, your leadership in the family reflects also the family. The family is very serious about family. So when you, when you have a leader, you want to have somebody who has, who has managed, who has been able, a couple, a family that has been able to raise their children, and to say, can you teach the family, the church, how to do it? So we, as family ministry directors and leaders in our, in our conferences and leaders, people look at us, we conduct these seminars, but they're looking at how you relate to your wife. More than they do to our, to our pastor, who is not a family, you have been appointed or elected in your conference and union as a family ministry leader because we think your family, not that you have a hand, you have a perfect family, but there's so much you can share with this union on how to raise uh, God's family families. So you can't just say, no, I'm just like everybody. No, you're not just like everybody, you're a leader. People are looking up to you to see how you look at the wife, to see how you treat your wife. Because whatever you do, they say, maybe this is how we should do it also. Because, because the whole union is appointed him as a leader. That means the union wants us to also emulate that, that person. People don't grow. They, they, people, uh, uh, as you know, in leadership, they don't rise beyond and above their leaders. No, they, they use you as a standard. If, if they do, then we don't need leaders. Amen. Yeah. All right. Um, the only aspect of God's creation that He evaluated as not good, what was it? It is not good for man to be. To be alone. And that uh, brings us to the idea that um, uh, when God gifted humankind with marriage, um, He was trying to emphasize the importance of relationship. Because remember, Adam made a relationship with God. That's why the, 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 the exact way it's not just loneliness, it's not it's alone. It's alone. Loneliness is a separation issue. He was alone. There was no one like him. There was no one to converse with. There were, there, were, there were animals that were wrong, but he was alone in that sense. Even though there was, he had a relationship with God, but as a human being, he needed another human being to connect with. And so when God created marriage, when God instituted marriage, it was also to create this fellowship so that men can be able to relate. And because it's a relational human being, it's a relationship. So that was a gift. Now I'm, I'm going to say something and explain about it. Because sometimes when you look at marriage in the Garden of Eden in the Old Testament, right there in the beginning, we then think this is how it is today. There are some changes. And we're going to be looking at that as well. Otherwise, we create serious problems, especially in our traditional understanding of, of marriage. So marriage is, is God's gift to who? To the humankind. Um, even, even after sin. You know, as marriage can actually, if this is like when God uh, is still married, it was not just him saying, yeah, there's not going to be sin, we're going to be living forever. But it looks like God, even in his institution of marriage, he makes sure that this institution will also somehow um, um, minister um, to uh, community even after the fall. Mm -hmm. So marriage even fits in this period that we live in as, as a tool that God can use to bring us to bring us together. Now it's it's clear then that if God instituted marriage, I mean marriage is holy, if God instituted Sabbath, Sabbath is holy, um, then the, then then you you would not be surprised to see that Christ, when he came here, he, he did not say, we no longer need the Sabbath, as some people say, um, the Sabbath was for the Jews. If the Sabbath was for the Jews, then marriage was also for the Jews. The Sabbath was created for men, and marriage was also created for, for men. And one of the first recorded miracles, you remember in John 2, 
Where was I? Uh, the way you said it, that's where he was. That's where he uh, introduced or ushered to his inaugurated his, his, his ministry. And the way the Ellen White says, there he wanted to show that he came to minister to our happiness. There was no one sick at that wedding. And really, there was no one with leprosy. There was no one who was dead, but Christ performed the miracle. And that miracle was just for the extension of happiness, that's all. Even if Christ did not perform the miracle, the wedding would have continued, the man would have married. I mean, it happens. Run out of food. Well, okay, go home. It's an embarrassment, but go home. Some of us think about more, so much about food that we forget about the union. Um, and that's why in our counseling, we need to talk to the, those who are going to get married because they get so preoccupied with this food and that thing. They, they forget about the relationship. They, the relationship after the food. After the beautiful music and the garments and the appreciation, they the relationship. Where the difference between a wedding and a marriage. In a wedding, life is very, marriage is lifelong. So Christ was there to minister to our happiness, to say that I support life. Because when you know when there's marriage, then the theme of children, the theme of families coming together. And Christ was there. And he was there. He performed that miracle. What was the last miracle that Christ performed again? Can you remember? The first one was at a wedding. What was the last one? This is also recorded in the book of John. But after that miracle, there was the performing the miracle. Yeah, you see, that was the last one. He was not attending a funeral. He was bringing an end to a funeral. <coughs> then after that, it was going to be very difficult for him to say, and now they really wanted to kill him. So at first you see him at, 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 at the wedding there, at the marriage wedding at Cana, making sure that, uh, just to let us know that he is for you. And at the end of his ministry, what does he do? He brings life. Amen? But then we need to, can I, can I get a mic now? We need, to, we need to reflect now on this within our context. Um, all right. You know what's the problem? You know what can be a challenge with this? Then, you know, God instituted marriage because marriage is so important. Traditional, in our cultures, marriage is very important. Am I right? Yeah. It is very important. In some cultures, maybe you could just make one or two, if you could do that. What happens when a person was supposed to have married and he dies and, 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 and unmarried? Do you have any rituals that are performed? In your, I'm not saying by you, but where you come from, uh, <laughs> traditionally. Are there rituals that are performed before one is, is buried, if he dies not married? Can you just tell me what, can you just share one, one or two? Yes, sir. Uh, can you can give him the, the mic? We really need to stay closer. Because this is where the challenge is going to be. So because marriage is so important, then we look at those who are not as if there's something wrong with them. So let's, let's look at that. Let's bring the balance in there. Yes, sir. Did you tell me? When you die, uh, when you are not alive, when you are being buried, you put your both hands between your knees. I'm not laughing. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm not going to ask you the significance, but that's how that's how that's how that's how you're buried. Either like this, your hands, and like this, both okay. hands. Is it this one? Must look better. Okay. Yes, sir.
In other words, there's a displeasure. There's, there's, there's something that the community feels there's something wrong for you to die and you're not married. And we're not going to get into this to take the whole lot of why, why, why why these people are done our understanding of them and the, the afterlife. I'm raising this because we live in those communities. And some of us do those things that as as activists. We actually reflect our own understanding of marriage and we think this is how God looks at it. And we won't come to that right now. Uh, yes, there's the last hand there. Uh, okay, there's another one. Just share with us how what but really the impact you know, I, I just wanted to appreciate the type of culture which can give us that can appreciate. Oh, where where is that coming from? And that's where some uh, anthropologists who want to take note. Okay, that's just uh, just give you the support to that one. Just indicate when you say culture, then we can say when we go home. You know, there's a culture in this place. This is what they do yesterday. I mean, if I'm from Zimbabwe, I understand it. I want to make They will look for the rates. They what? The rates. Okay. In retirement. They can go faster than to your most senior employee. They, they tie the rates to you. And bear you with the red. Sure. All right. Here's another one. And that's from Zimbabwe. And we're going to have another one from Rwanda. South Sudan. This is how I was in South Sudan. We have some major tribes. When you die and you are not married, of course you will be married. But you will be married a lady. And your brother will be responsible, and that lady, that woman, you will produce the children in the name of the deceased. All right. So it's not your children, but it is the children of that deceased. Okay. You, you, so you are touching on something. Maybe we should have combined these two elements. You're not only touching on marriage, you're also talking about children. That not only should you get married, but you, you must have children. Correct. This is very important. This is now. Do you know what the Bible says? Okay. Now we're going to bring a balance here. That you must get married. You must have children. Already you can see pressure now. There's pressure to the one who's not married. To the extent that you can marry anyone just to get married. Because remember, the issue of who if you married, but you must get married. Number two, you must have children. All right, Mama here. And then we go to. We want to, but you get the idea. And then let's just challenge that so that when we leave here, we can say this is how um, the Bible looks at marriage. In some culture, they say that when you are not married and you die, you're going to be a charcoal. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Yeah. And and what do they say? A charcoal. A charcoal. A charcoal. Yes. What is a charcoal? The, you know the. Uh, oh, oh, the, the fire, the event. Okay. Yeah, the okay. They put it in your case, then they go away. I have never experienced this, but I'm told you that I'm not married. That's what I But you know, it's funny because you're not married. All right, thank you very much. He gave the challenge for that. If you are not careful, if you are not careful with the church, we will create a situation where we say, if you are not married, there's something wrong with you. Today, for Adam and Eve, that marriage was so different because we wouldn't be here. All right? If there was no way Adam would say, nah. I choose not to get married. I mean, I mean, look, this thing is for you to get married. You must get married. Adam and Eve, you must get married. And not only that, and do what? Not and that. So you should, you should have, this is compulsory. That. Because that's how we want to fill up the earth. So if they don't do that, if they will be disobeying God. But the problem is to move from there and then run in all the way and go through the New Testament and come to us and say, and that's the case also for you. It's not. The, the whole world is full of people now. We never need your children. To a point where the whole world will come to an end if you don't have your children. Marriage is a choice. How do we know that? How do we know that marriage today, in the New Testament, marriage is presented not as a must? How do we know that? Now, 
Now, if, if you, do you know what's going to happen? If you keep entertaining these ideas about marriage, you're going to have a problem with Jesus Christ. And some people don't understand that Christ. Don't talk to me about Christ. That man was never married. Yes. Some are actually trying to organize a wife for, for Jesus Christ. They must have a wife somewhere. Others, how do you present a man who died on the cross and there's no one? But besides Jesus, who else? What else can we learn from the Jesus about, about marriage? What example can we bring? Paul. Paul actually relativizes his marriage. He says, if, 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 if it were for me, I would say not yet, my God. But because of other issues that we are facing, it's okay. So that's all he said is you don't have, it's not a must. Now we need to say that. Because if you don't say that, our material will think that if I'm 32 and I don't marry, then something is wrong with me. And I must marry even if it means marrying someone who's not a Nazareth. He's not a Christian. Who does not believe in God. As long as I get married. Actually, we put pressure on those kids. You must marry because you are, a, you, are, you are ashamed to the family by not getting married. And that's not right. It is not right. And you can't run and quote and quote um, Adam and Eve. This is not Adam. This is not Eve. Why don't you quote Christ? Why don't you quote Paul? Why don't you quote we are not saying marriage is not important. It is not what we are saying. It is important, it is, it is divinely uh, instituted, but it doesn't mean everyone. I mean, it's not everyone who gets married. That's number one. Number two, what about children? Once we make marriage relative, it's, it's important, but it's, it's not like you must not the level commandment, thou shalt get married. So it's not, it's not like that. So also, also with children, a couple can get married, and for another reason, uh, they go to doctors and they don't have children, and so what? So, should they be, uh, be insulted and be called names? No, people know. Uh, we give them names in our communities. What, what names are given to couple who, who have no children in your, in our context? Mm -hmm. In the last name, they are called to more one. And that's, that's not a nice term, more one. It's an insult. What I mean, if you go to another one, but I know it's negative. <laughs> to call that. So that now you, you feel that you are, and as a result, of our children, our, our, our members are looking for help everywhere. Because they're looking at children. They go to churches where they promise that you'll be pregnant here. Then it becomes a, a serious issue because of the schedule. But what's worse when you see that in the church as well? You know, you know, I know this is a problem. Because in our family ministries, we then don't even cater for the sin. Because nobody's supposed to be sinning. They're supposed to be married. No, we cannot look into that. We look at the marriage. But once you know that there are people that should be seen, and how can we make sure that they also find a place and they can be 